Uh, on fighting, fighting sex trafficking in Georgia, it's with our Attorney General, Chris Carr. Um, today's program is brought to you through the generous donations of the members of the World Affairs Council. Y'all keep donating generously. We need it. Uh, Nathan Deal, Governor Nathan Deal appointed Chris Carr attorney, is Georgia's 54th Attorney General in November 2016. Then in 2018, he was elected to serve a full four-year term. Previously, he was the commissioner of the Georgia Department of Economic Development for three years. Under his leadership, the department helped facilitate over a thousand projects across the state that represented over $14 billion investment and created more than 84,000 jobs. Previously, Chris Carr was chief of staff for Johnny Isaacson. He received both his MBA and his law degree from the University of Georgia. I'm going to ask everybody to please send questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Make them short. Make them in in a question mark. That would be very cool. Um, and have them stick on topic. Um, that, that would also be very helpful. So, Attorney General Carr, let me ask you. How did you choose sex trafficking as one of the issues that you wanted to focus on? As I understand it, the Attorney General's office, I mean, literally has no law enforcement function. I mean, you represent the state in court, but the police don't work for you. The GBI does not work for you. I mean, how did you how did you decide to choose this as one of your focuses? Well, that's a great question. And Ambassador, thank you so much for having me. And it's great to be let me just say, great to be back with the World Affairs Council of Atlanta and you. And as you mentioned, uh, very fortunate to be able to work with you when I was with uh, Senator Isaacson and then again at, at Economic Development. And, and I appreciate uh, the World Affairs Council focusing on this issue. We actually do have limited criminal jurisdiction. So mm -hmm. you're, you're absolutely right. In Georgia, sheriffs are constitutionally separate. DAs are constitutionally separate. Uh, the police will work for a municipality. The state patrol works, uh, actually reports to the governor. We're the lawyers for the executive branch of state government. But we do have concurrent jurisdiction on certain issues, including human trafficking. And so when I became attorney general in 2016, my predecessor, Sam Olins, had actually made this an issue as well, as well as many uh, state attorneys general from around the country. It's a bipartisan issue. Uh, mm -hmm. and it, it's it's not an issue, um, uh, you know, that, that anybody opposes that I can see the state making a priority, although I will say Georgia has made it more of a priority than others. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But so I came in in, in 2016. The office had a, a, a great uh, uh, staffer that was focusing on training. But the state has had concurrent jurisdiction going back uh into Thurber Baker's years, and and uh, uh, we were granted that jurisdiction, and, and but due to a variety of reasons, hadn't gotten the personnel or the funding to do much more beyond that. Well, we decided once I dug into the issue a little bit more and understood what we're talking about, and, and I've got a, a daughter and a stepdaughter. My daughter's now 16, stepdaughter 22. But when you start looking at the, at the average age of a human trafficking victim being a 12 to 14 year old girl, well, that was the age of my daughter as I kind of came in. We're talking about six to eight graders. Now, human trafficking can come in different forms, labor trafficking, sex trafficking, both of children and of adults. And the state has focused largely on domestic minor sex trafficking. Not can you tell me, just, just for a second, I'm going to interrupt you here. Sure. Tell me the demographics. I mean, who's being sex trafficked in Georgia? Is it? You, an age group or who are they are they young Large. women girls who are being brought into the state are they uh girls who, who from big cities from rural areas who, who are they all over the state it's generally a demographic it, as i mentioned the average victim is a 12 to 14 year old girl now it's not just girls it's boys as well transgender children and oftentimes it is a vulnerable population that that, that Homelessness can be a part of it. Uh, addiction can be a part of it. In addition, kids can, you know, there's a story that one of the state senators told me that there was a young woman, a young girl in her district that ran away. And, and mm -hmm. see this as runaways is, a, is an issue. Uh, and within 24, 48 hours, this guy had found her and 
said, I'll give you a place to stay, and then also gave her drugs and alcohol and that sort of thing, and, and uh, fortunately, she was rescued. But it's all across the state, and this isn't just a George issue. As I mentioned, we've got a, AGs around the country. It's a global issue. It's a global issue, but um, Georgia Cares is a nonprofit that had helped us on the rehabilitation side. A couple years ago, Georgia Care said that they had victims from 130 of Georgia's 159 counties. Wow. And so largely kids from Georgia. But yes, you can be trafficked across state lines. And going back to my economic development days, we're great for business because we have Hartsfield Jackson International Airport. We have the ports. We have roads. We have rail. So that means that we are two hours by plane and two days by rail or truck from 80 percent of the U.S. market. That's great for business. But criminals can also use that logistics network to traffic in guns and human beings and drugs and that sort of thing. So as I've said, you don't stop investing in logistics, but you do crack down on crime. So that's what we've done. And so we have, as I mentioned, we had jurisdiction, but it wasn't until last July due to the legislature's support, the governor and the first lady, that we now have a first of its kind human trafficking prosecutions unit that has seven team members three lawyers and, and four professionals that work with DAs, that work with our federal, state, and local law enforcement partners to eradicate. Are, 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 all, are, are all 17 of those from your office? Just seven. Yeah, there are seven in our okay. office, but we'll work with the GBI and the FBI. We recently did uh, Operation Not Forgotten, which was a missing children's op where we found, we recovered 39 kids, 15 of which, though, are suspected human trafficking victims. So we work with the you know uh, U.S. Marshals. You work with DAs and sheriffs. And again, so this is an issue. Folks have really rallied around. And, and Ambassador, I think you'll appreciate this. I, I took the lessons that I learned from Senator Isaacson and Governor Deal at Economic Development, which is when you have limited resources, let's come together. Let's not worry about who's you know who's going to get credit or this, that, or the other thing. But let's bring everyone together. And have better outcomes, and, and that's the approach we've taken. Unfortunately, our uh, partners have been that way as well. And our, I, I got to say, our GBI director Vic Reynolds is just phenomenal. He's been a DA, he's been a police officer, so that partnership is somebody we work very closely with every day. GBI just been great. Do you have any yeah, idea yeah. how many people are we talking about? We don't. The the hard part about human trafficking it truly is in the shadows, in part because. The data is siloed. You'll have federal data. You'll have local jurisdictions. Again, we have 159 counties. Uh, so you could have, you know, clerk's offices all around the state. You can have police departments, municipalities. You've got all different kind of law enforcement, and we don't have a central data, centralized database. You, we can get some data from Polaris, which is a nonprofit that runs a hotline, and how many come from Georgia. Um, but it's it, so the data is kind of hard to, to, to come by. And folks will say, well, isn't Atlanta a hub, you know, one of the top places? I, I don't know if we are or we're not, but we know that we have a problem just like New York or Chicago or Miami or elsewhere. But I do know this we have become the number one state to eradicate human trafficking when you have the governor and the legislature, our U.S. attorneys, and everybody coming together. Um, it matters. It really matters. And so we're focused on it. But we do need to get the data, and we are trying to figure out the best way to to uh, capitalize on that, and and it will help us be data driven in our decision making. It seems like, um, com you know, big companies, you know, that somehow Amazon Web Services or Google or I don't know what who, you know, should be able to bring that some of the data together to help you. That that would make it easier. Anyway, and, that, and that's what we. There, there are opportunities to do that. And again, some places are, are more online than others as far as where that information would be. But I will commend the private sector. The private sector's really jumped in and stepped in. Uber has trained its drivers. Mm -hmm. We have UPS here in Atlanta. Think about it. UPS is in every neighborhood around the world. Mm -hmm. Truckers Against Trafficking, they have spearheaded the training program. Delta has become the eyes in the sky. They have made this a priority uh, for their company. And so, again, the more eyes, the more training, the more awareness that we have, the better outcomes we're, we're, we, will, we will achieve. We've got to get over that stigma that people will look at a situation, maybe have been trained, maybe have, have some awareness. They'll see a red flag, but then go, well, it probably isn't what I think it is. It would be much, it'd be better to tell law enforcement and be wrong 
than to let one more child be abused. So how, how do you, I mean, if, if you're talking about uh, teenage children, how do you get them on a plane? I mean, who's, who's going with them? How, I mean, they have a captor that's traveling with them. How, how does that work? There can be. And, 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 you know, again, the red flag is older adult, younger child, not making eye contact, no luggage or limited luggage and those types of things. But ambassador, what we're finding is yes, there are trafficking situations where people are flying into or out of Atlanta or into or out of the United States, but it's largely right here at home. I mean, and, and you can use a, there was a, a, a prostitution sting that occurred on the north side of Atlanta not long ago. Mm-hmm. When you look at who the buyers and, and focusing on buyers as well as traffickers is important. And that's what we've all been doing. Nonprofits like Street Grace and others, Wellspring, you got to focus on the buyers as well as the sellers. But if you look at Atlanta only, and this is just Atlanta, most of the buyers came from the northern suburbs of Atlanta. Mm-hmm. A lot of this is done online now. Hey, we're going to be in Valdosta on Monday. We'll be in Columbus on Tuesday. There's a lot of that information. It would be great to have the tech companies more involved. We've had a few issues with federal legislation, Section 230, the Communications Decency Act, we've had to go in, which was intended to protect children from predators. But what it did is it excluded state and local law enforcement from being able to prosecute as it related to some online crimes. We've changed that now, which is why Backpage and some others had to close down. But it's it can be very tech focused. It can be online. Um, and we've got, again, those are the partnerships that matter. And the private sector can play such a critically important role and have in many respects, but there's more that I think we can do. Is this taking place in hotels and motels or apartments uh, in people's homes? I mean, how does, how does it work? Three. Any place where, uh, you know, again, they, they, they're, these folks are running it like a business. Yes, it happens in hotels. And the hotel industry has been very good about training, particularly uh, since, since I've come on, you can just see an increase. Uh, but I'll tell you, there have been times where there are hotels that are known operators. Mm-hmm. And Vic Reynolds, when he was in Cobb County, um, we we had a situation with a, a a day's in up in Cobb County off Windy Hill that continuously folks were getting arrested and we we're rescuing victims. And so he and I said, well, let's try something outside the box. So we actually, to make a long story short, Wyndham owns Days In. Days In started in Georgia, of course. And we called the Wyndham General Counsel, who happened to be at Alston and Bird once upon mm-hmm. a time, Atlanta firm. And we called up and said, hey, look, this is to, yeah, I am the attorney general and he's the DA, but we're also parents and we're also human beings just like you are. And we know you're not for human trafficking because it says so right there on your website. Help us rid this property of human trafficking. And we got talking about franchises and this, that, and the other thing, but they came back to us and said, absolutely, we'll help. And, And we've had a situation where the company came in and helped us change management. Management was involved in the process, as you can imagine. But those are the types of things that we can do. And again, you got the private sector that can help you. But uh, uh, apartments, homes, it can be any, which is why awareness and training is critically important because it's happening everywhere. It's happening in Atlanta or, you know, Augusta or small towns. You can't presume it's not, it's not happening. But once you have more eyes on the issue, uh, the better off and better outcomes we're going to have. What does the state do? You, you mentioned you rescued 39 victims in Operation Not Forgotten. What then happens to the victims? Are they just sent home? They get counseling? What how, 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 What happens next? No, great question. Rehabilitation. Because let's think about this for a minute. Again, let's say the average age, again, sixth to eighth grade girl. Mm-hmm. You've been taken out. I mean, you go. Sixth to eighth grade girls should be in middle school, and they should be involved in sports, or they should be involved in the arts, or whatever. But here you take them from from that and and put them in a situation where they have had horrific experiences that you or I cannot imagine Mm -hmm. at a time that they should be in school. But they're going to need emotional services. They may need health care services. They may, again, school is going to be an issue. We've got some great nonprofits that we partner with. And we say kind of the three elements of of how we approach human trafficking for is is awareness and education. prosecution, legislation, and rehabilitation. And rehabilitating those victims, those survivors, uh, is really important. So Wellspring Living is a national leader on um, 
on this issue and, and uh, we've got an intake facility uh, that uh, op that uh, Wellspring Living uh, operates and that's when the victims and these survivors are recovered take them there to get evaluation to make sure that these wraparound services but it's critically important and it won't be an overnight recovery I mean it's going to take um, you know years in, in many respects and that's understandable again the situations that these kids have been in but that rehabilitation uh, is critically important getting them back to school or getting for those uh, survivors that are older job skills to get out of that life to make sure that there are other opportunities you said that the unit in here in georgia is an, an example um, I assume you do you share best practices with counterparts in other states. Are they are people coming to Georgia to see what you're doing? Uh, yes. In fact, we've had the federal government come down several times. Folks from the Department of Justice were here last week or two weeks ago that are are uh, we had folks from DOJ and, and a couple of, of other uh, entities that came down a couple of weeks ago. We had the uh, attorney general for the United States come down with uh, Ivanka Trump, who's focused on human trafficking because they're recognizing the way Georgia's is doing it in a collaborative fashion based on those three principles that I said of awareness, education, uh, prosecution and, and rehabilitation. They've come down from best practices. I mentioned this is a big issue for attorneys general. The National Association of Attorneys General has a subcommittee on human trafficking. There are a lot of different, you know, it's one of these issues, Ambassador, that really awareness has, 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 has increased over the last three to four years. So there's a lot more conversation. We're doing training at the state. The first lady has now um, put together a training program for all state employees. Uh, Criminal Justice Coordinating Council does training. So th there's a whole lot that, that, that we're doing and we're sharing best practices and, and folks are getting together because you really do want law enforcement, you want nonprofits, you want educators all at the table talking about the best way we can approach it. Um, I was talking this weekend with a friend of mine who's a psychiatrist who works for the state. Um, and he said, I, I mean, this I, I found it amazing. One of the things that he was saying is that if that runaway girls in particular says within 48 hours of the time they run away from home or it's very typical for them to be grabbed by traffickers, be drugged and be um, caught up in this drug this sex trafficking business. Is, is that accurate or is that it an is. exaggeration? It, it's like the uh, state rep had mentioned to me or state senator had mentioned to me earlier. That's exactly the timeline that we saw. Um, and it, it's terrifying when you think about it. But, but these folks that are recruiting children to be sold for sex, they have honed this skill of, of really focusing on, um, you know, providing a, a place to stay, giving food, providing drugs, whatever it may be. And what they've done in, in Ambassador, which is that they've tried to fill a gap and they try to create this, um, I think, this perception of love. You will see these victims and these survivors that don't want to be rescued at the beginning because they think that their uh, seller actually loves them or wants to get married someday. And so that goes back to the, the wraparound services that are really needed because there's that, that, that uh, mental health side of the equation that truly needs to be discussed. But they'll try to fill this gap that I really love you and I'll take care of you and your parents didn't love you, but I do. I mean, it's a mind game and it's, it's, it's dangerous and it is terrifying to see what they do. So having the professionals like, well, and we have at Wellspring, which does an outstanding job. It's you know, they're, they're, they're restoring Hope facility, just a great intake facility. But, but I mean, again, it's just terrifying to see how it is done. And the initial response and our human trafficking prosecutions unit, uh, one of our professionals is a victim's advocate uh, because you got to recognize that it is a tough uh, situation in order to get that survivor to the point where we can prosecute the individual in court if there's another trial. You don't want to re-traumatize the individual. Oh, absolutely. And you know that some of them are not a willing witness. And and again, it's a, it's that's what makes it so complicated, so challenging. And what, what about the 
I don't know what the right word is it customers. I mean, are you prosecuting people uh, who, who are purchasing these services? Absolutely. In fact, Street Grace has a program called Demand and End, and it focuses on the demand side. And we've been a part of that We kind of when we first got in. From the state legislature perspective, we have added penalties for buyers. Uh, it's the, I mean, it's the right thing to do. But too often, you were just focusing on, A, the supply side, which is mm -hmm. awful, and you should. We were also treating the victims and the survivors as criminals. Well, we've gotten away in recognizing they truly are victims. They are survivors. We don't need to treat them as criminals. But we've also focused on the fact you got to go after the buyers. I mean, it's, that's right. what the, the market is. And they need to uh, be held to account as well. So in Georgia, each year that we've been in the legislature, it seems like we've added something that has focused on the demand side, the buyer side. Um, and again, I think that's part of what we've done to, to push Georgia to the forefront of dealing with this issue in a holistic way. So you, you mentioned awareness other than this Zoom call right now. I mean, what, what are y'all doing to get the word out, to let people know, uh, to let the buyers know they're going to go to jail, to uh, alert parents, to get the people at desk clerks at motels across the state uh, aware of this? Training, 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 and awareness, awareness, awareness. So we're using social media. We've trained, we'll train groups, school groups, church groups, community groups, you name it. Uh, and that's part of what we're a part of the, the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council training program. You can reach out to us. Street Grace has training. You know, there are so many different groups, nonprofits that are now doing that. But it, it, it it's it, the, the issue has gotten out, as I mentioned to you. I think we are. We, and I say we collectively, uh, society has done a very good job of focusing on this issue and getting the word out. But there are specific red flags. There are hotlines that folks can call. There is law enforcement that you can get involved in. So to be able to train, I would encourage uh, anyone that's on today and, and uh, any of the folks that are part of the World Affairs Council, if you want to have a training program, we can put you in touch with the right folks. Oh, that's great. There are training programs, and, and Katie Bird, who is our communications director, here at the department can coordinate that and, and get folks uh, uh, together. But it re really is about more eyes on the problem, better outcomes. Uh, you mentioned the first lady a couple of times. What What is Marty Kemp's role? What is she doing? Well, even before she and the governor got in office, they made this an issue and I really commend them for it. But what she's done is created the Grace Commission. And what the Grace Commission has been is basically taking all the players in this space, getting them in the room together to find out what everybody's doing and where we need to go. So mm -hmm. better co coordination, best practices, and then looking to the future, what, does, what needs to be done legislatively, what needs to be done in the private sector. One of the issues she's identified and the Grace Commission has identified, it goes back to the survivors and the victims. We only have so many beds for the rehab and, and, and restoration of these victims around the state. Very limited. We need more. So again, that goes back to data. We need to mine the data, find out where a lot of these are occurring, where we need to have, but we've got some beds in Atlanta. We have some in middle Georgia. We've got a, 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 a group, House of Hope, down on the coast. So there are some that are doing it, but we need we need more. Unfortunately, when you start seeing um, you know, more and more children, 130 counties that we've had victims, you know, just two years ago, that, that hasn't, and COVID hasn't stopped it either, Ambassador. That's the other thing. I mean, a lot of it's done online and a lot of it has still continued. So that's, she, but, but the first lady, and, and again, I've said this before, when governors and first ladies make issues, issues, it matters mm -hmm. to raise that awareness. It matters. And she really has put her heart into this, bringing all of us together to make sure that we're we, we have a coordinated effort in this state. We're getting questions from the audience. Greg Colleen wants to know what the economics are. I mean, how much money are we talking about? We're talking about millions of dollars a year? Well, billions, if you look at it kind of nationwide. And, you know, it's, again, it's hard to get the data, so, but studies have been done. I think uh, the, the last one, the major one was done, I think, in 2014. Uh, but we talked about, you know, the, the impact of it, and it's billions of dollars nationwide. Uh, again, just think about it globally, just expound upon that. Hard to get the data, but that's the, the, the studies that we've seen, you know, again, puts it not in the millions, you know, but in the billions. Is there a connection between this? I mean, we all see you know, whether you're driving 
down a highway or you're driving on Cheshire Bridge, you know, you see these adult uh, entertainment places. Is, is there a connection between that and this or is, are those two, two separate things? Well, I know, you know, we, you know we've got a lawsuit that's going on because there's now a safe harbor. Uh, we had a constitutional amendment that would take some of the tax revenue from adult entertainment facilities to put into a fund for survivors. And mm -hmm. so I've got to be kind of cautious because that's still being litigated. Uh, but yes, we would make the argument that that absolutely, when you start looking at it, it you know, in, in any number of forms, that um, it, 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 it it's all kind of it can be in there together. Now, look, there are legal ways to run adult entertainment, and the First Amendment protects certain issues. But I, I see adults different from children too. Mm -hmm. We're talking about when we talk about domestic minor sex trafficking again. We're talking about people buying and selling children for sex. There's no. First Amendment protection there at all. That is, and some have argued, we're talking about children here, and so it's it's a different situation as far as that goes. Uh, but again, we've got the litigation going on now, so I don't want to get too much farther into it. But we would argue, absolutely, it does. Mary Vidarty has it, and you've, you've answered this a little bit. How has the pandemic affected human trafficking? Yeah, un unfortunately, it hasn't stopped it. And and one of the things we worry about with schools being closed is you don't have children going to school to report right. child abuse, you know, sex, sexual abuse, sex trafficking, that sort of thing. But we know it, it hasn't abated at all. We know it's online. Again, we do Operation Not Forgotten and Rescue 39 Kids, not all of which were human trafficking, but 15 were, or at least suspected. Mm -hmm. um, so it just hasn't abated at all. And, and, and again, criminals are they're trying to find any way they can to make money, as I said selling humans, selling drugs, selling guns, but uh, COVID has not, the pandemic has not uh, abated this issue at all that we can see. Brandon and in Bailey, fact, it may have made it a bit worse just because it's in the shadows and you don't have a chance to have, you know, again, kids around teachers and principals and sure, counselors sure. and that kind of thing. That makes sense. Brandon Thank Bailey has, we've discussed, we've discussed how we can, how we can find, find and help, help these victims, victims of human trafficking human already, already in Georgia. Georgia. What can we what do can to we help, do help stop, stop them before them they, before they at, at the airports? Well, we've and we've got good and let me say, Hartsfield's an incredible partner. Uh, they have they got out front before a lot of of uh, airports did, and they're again trained to see folks that have come in and, and as they're coming in. If I understand the question properly, maybe others. I can't speak for any other state, but I can speak for Hartsfield. And Hartsfield's been a good partner. There has not been a uh, a you know tremendous number of people getting arrested because they were human trafficking and in part it may be because of the training in part uh, folks may know that don't come through Hartsfield but again I also I think that a lot of the issue is more driving here and there or homegrown so there is a piece as I said before that I think is certainly uh, airline based or airport uh, affiliated but I think a lot of it ends up being homegrown or you're driving from one place to the next versus flying but that's where it's that awareness and that training piece to get them get folks before they ever get on a plane. Okay, I'm trying to. It's harder to get the chat. When, okay, here's from <laughs> Marsha Vishnevsky, and she says, "How can we get involved, the audience? How can we get involved in raising awareness? Are there volunteer volunteer opportunities? Um, what 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 can individual citizens do to get involved?" Absolutely, absolutely, they can, Ambassador. There are, as I mentioned, nonprofits such as Street Grace, Wellspring Living, Out of Darkness. There are uh, faith-based groups that are focused on human trafficking. You can contact our office, and we can get you in touch with some of the nonprofits. But volunteering, and, and the nonprofits, each one of them has a different focus. Street Grace, as I mentioned, does more awareness and training and education. Wellspring does more on the restoration and rehabilitation. Uh, side out of darkness is is kind of focusing on the buyers and that so you could you, if I would encourage you to look at the different organizations to see what the fit was but volunteering there training having a training program at whatever organization uh, you have influence with um, and then at the end of the day too these nonprofits it's like the World Affairs Council I don't I don't want to uh, double the message but there's a financial assistance piece that that also helps them do what they do so give to the world affairs council and like and find a nonprofit that does work in the human trafficking 
You, you mentioned we should reach out to Katie Bird. How do we find her email address and phone number? Is it on your website? Yep, it's on our website, but kbird, B-Y-R-D, at law.ga.gov. I think that's right. If Katie, I think Katie may be listening in. She can potentially put on the chat feature what her uh, contact information may be, and so hopefully that will come through. If not, Ambassador, we will get you her contact information and get it out to the group. Excellent. We'll send this out to everybody who's on the call. I've got uh, Godwin Onowosa, and I apologize for mispronouncing your name, who's the CEO of Square Globe, Inc., a film production company. We're working on a movie, Neighbor, dealing with the subject matter. Um, how can we help? Oh, great. Uh, well, again, getting the word out. with, And, and as the former Commissioner of Economic Development that had the Film Commission, let me say thank you very much for, for uh, investing in Georgia. Uh, Katie can get you information that you may need. Uh, be happy to you know, provide any information that could be helpful on that. But again, it's raising awareness. It's getting the word out. It's doing it, doing it in the medium that you have chosen. And I think that that's really important. And I appreciate you doing it. Uh, Katie's put her uh, email address on the chat function, so everybody should have it there. Right. David Cut David Cutting, who's the honorary consul of Barbados in Atlanta, asks about. He said, "It's not a question." State says the Georgia Human Trafficking Institute has good data. They do. They've got some data. Good. That's, so uh, are they related to you, or they're an independent, an independent nonprofit? Okay. Affiliated uh, with the uh, Center for Civil and Human Rights, if I'm not mistaken, I think is is uh, the consul is correct, uh, and uh, appreciate. Look, the consular corps has been very helpful on this as well, and and uh, appreciate their involvement, and of course appreciate all that they do in in uh, Atlanta and our state. I'm getting a whole bunch of questions. Like, who who are the the buyers? I mean, are they? Is there a demographic? I mean. You said a bunch of people were busted in North Atlanta. I mean, are they well-off people? Or are they? I mean, I, or is it just across the board? Who who who's involved in this? Well, so it, it is across the board. Again, you got to be careful on on you know putting too fine of a point. But but generally speaking, again, a victim is a 12, 14 year old girl. I had a fraternity brother that did some marketing for uh, a, a number of entities in Atlanta, and the Institute for Human Trafficking may be part of this. They put out a an ad campaign that I thought was very, very effective uh, about a year or so ago. When they did their market research, again, focusing on Atlanta, so it all, you know, I can't tell you what the what they're seeing in Columbus or Savannah, but um, the average buyer that they identified was a 38-year-old married male with two children. Oh, my word. That's what they found. And I think it's pretty good data that, that they came up with, but that's it. But but again, it can be, and, and one of the things that we'll see too is you will see some of these operations that are focusing on online uh, chats and, uh, you know, again, and, and to the parents out there, here's the thing that's also pretty terrifying. Recruiting comes on any app that has the ability for two human beings to chat with each other. So TikTok and Instagram and Twitter and Tinder and Grinder and all these apps, it's happening on there. And that's where some of these both business transactions, the transactions are occurring as well as the recruitment. Uh, and so anybody that has access to these apps can, can utilize that as well. So, but that's to ask about the buyers. That was the data that I got from them as it related to Atlanta. Sherry Williams asks, what are the signs we should be looking for in our communities, in our schools? And I guess I'd add, are, 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 I mean, what are the conversations that we ought to be having with our own children? Well, I'll answer the last one first. The same one I've had is be careful on these apps. You have no earthly idea who you are talking to. And just because they say that they are a 15 or 16 year old boy does not mean that that's in fact who is actually on the other side. So really, again, it's just having kind of that awareness of, and, and, and again, having a 16-year-old and a 22-year-old, we know they do everything on that phone or they do everything on that com on their computer. I mean, they want the phone more than they want to drive because now they have access to the world this way versus when I was coming up, he wanted to get in the car. Um, so so that's, you know, so, so you know, that's the, the first piece. And Ambassador, what was the first question that you asked me before? 
about talking to children. Well, what what are the, what are the uh, signs for schools oh, signs. and yeah, schools, yeah. airports? I mean, what what should we be you know in our churches and synagogues? I mean, what should we be looking for? Yeah. So again, so when uh, you see adults with children, they're not making eye contact. They're not talking with each other. You know, TSA will ask questions of well, why are you traveling? Where are you going? They don't know if they're, you know, they don't have, they don't, oh, they just forgot to bring their driver's license, their questions like that. We've had a situation where a deputy in Greene County stopped a car with an older male, younger girl, said that they were, it was his, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was his, um, his, his wife's child or a niece or something, but they only had one suitcase. They opened up the suitcase and some of the paraphernalia in there was drug related, sexual uh, in nature those types of things and with children it's the signs of abuse uh whether it is physical signs or the emotional signs of withdrawal those types of things this is where the training can help though truly uh we've got these great groups that can get the word out but those are some of the signs for folks to be looking for and again important you know, when, 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 when we're, you know, as, as, as society safely opens back up, those are the kinds of things where we have others that are, are, are trained to do these types of things to be able to be aware of it. Because I do worry a little bit again about physical abuse, sexual abuse, sex trafficking with kids. And it's hard to do that when, uh, when school's online. And I understand why we're doing it and doing it safely. But as we can open up, that's one of the benefits from, of, of being able to help those kids. Brendan Bailey asks, that he says uh, he's heard the jurisdiction issue, legal jurisdiction issues, hinder the ability of law enforcement to fight human trafficking. Is is that something that the legislature is dealing with? That you're dealing with? Is it is it really as big a problem as uh, Mr. Bailey thinks it is? Well, I, I would I would suggest that it was it's probably more of a resource resource personnel and expertise issue, more so. And I think that's part of why us having the statewide human trafficking prosecutions units helpful so that we can now look. I, I think that the DAs, particularly in Metro Atlanta, are, are unfortunately have the expertise and are more used to trying a human trafficking case. But if you get outside of Atlanta, that may not be something that sure. Green County always gets or, you know, not to, I'm not take, taking any one. We're working on cases in 11 different counties right now. We've had five different indictments. I'm really proud of the team. And that's during COVID with the courts being shut down. But again, working with these, these federal partners. But I think it's really an expertise. So what we want to do is if a community has a human trafficking case, and oftentimes they can be gang affiliated, 80% of all human trafficking cases are affiliated with some sort of gang. We've got a gang statute in the state. Not every, it's, it's sometimes tough. But as I'm told by our prosecutors, once you start getting into these human trafficking cases, they really are kind of like that onion. You start peeling it back, sure, there's sure. more and more. So maybe a certain office doesn't have the resources, the expertise to do it, and that's where we can come in and help. Or if you've got a situation where it's a, you know, a, a, the same individual has uh, had uh, been working in, in Valdosta and in Columbus and in Augusta where we have multiple jurisdictions, that may make more sense for our office to take that role. But in some cases, the DA's office can take it. But I don't know that it's jurisdictional as much, I think, as it is resource and expertise. But the other thing is coordinating, how important it is for federal, state, and local law enforcement and prosecutors to work together. And again, who cares who gets the credit when we're talking about trying to save lives and rescue children? If you know, we can, if people of goodwill want to make it happen, it'll happen. That's, that's great. That's, that's, that's terrific, Chris. Chris. I, want I want to congratulate you and your office, office and the, and efforts, the efforts, efforts that you're that making on this. Office. I got a, a last question that's sort of out of left field, and I want to apologize in advance. And that is, is the your last office... question is usually out of left field, Ambassador. Okay, well, good. This is going to be super left field. Are are you concerned, or is there some sort of coordination looking to uh, November third election day in case there's disturbances, violence? I don't know. Um, you know, and and presumably a long vote count is going to happen. Well, there's a number of lawsuits that have already been filed. George is kind of ground zero. We have been dealing with those lawsuits. We're still dealing with some lawsuits from 2016. Uh, number of lawsuits have been filed as it relates to 2020. It's a passionate issue. The most important thing is that the law is followed. 
and that is what our job is. No, I don't want anybody to be engaging in violence. Uh, and, you know, so, yes, there are folks that are focused on that. Um, obviously, uh, ballot security issues and making sure the election is, is uh, again, done according to the law. I do think if you start looking at it nationwide, um, it may take a while to get a result just due to, you know, some of the lawsuits that have been filed, some of the absentee ballots, the dates, that the due date, even if it's postmarked by the election day, coming in a few days later in some states. So, I, I, look, I, I think that the the weaponization of elections outcomes and lawsuits is troubling. I really do. I think that there are people that um, are using the uh, civil justice system and using the court system to accomplish things that couldn't get uh, accomplished in the legislature is troubling. And it, it's very costly for the taxpayer. I also believe that the fundamental, you know, again, the, the vote is critically important. That's how we decide we're governing ourselves. Um, and so, no, violence is not right. And no, we don't need to be engaged in it. This, you know, again, what separates America from so many places is our ability to, to self-govern and peaceful uh, transitions of power as they come and they go and accepting the outcomes. So, but I know, look, I've, I've been paying attention to the news just like everybody else, but, uh, I, you know, violence isn't right in, in any form or fashion and certainly not around elections. I just said it better. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, Attorney General Carr, thank you for spending 45 minutes with us today. Um, this has been great, been informative, uh, very, very useful. Um, also, I, I, everybody online, I want to tell you to please, tomorrow we've got the Ambassador of India to the United States at 1230. If you haven't registered for that, please register for the program. It's going to be great. We're going to talk about India-U.S. relations. So that'll be very It'd be really, really interesting for all of us. Join the World Affairs Council. If you're already a member, make a donation. If you don't want to join the council, you can still make a donation. We'd be delighted to have y'all. Please follow us on YouTube. Follow our YouTube uh, channel. And I want to thank Amanda Rutherford and Katie Burt from the Attorney General's Office. And I want to thank Fernanda Lucine, our Executive Director, and Valerie Lopez de Frank. Uh, who is the producer of this program from the World Affairs Council for what they have done uh, today. This has been great. Attorney General Chris Carr, thank you again. This has been a, 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 a terrifically informing, pro, informative program. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ambassador. Great to be with you. Good. Cool. Bye, everybody. See you all tomorrow. <laughs>